Okay, uh, today we are on uh, the first agricultural revolution. Um, last time we talked about people starting to um, be living at one place for a long time. They are, they are staying there longer and longer. And from climate point of view, the, the earth climate just have risen a few degrees, about two to three degrees. So temperature is a bit warmer and there are more rain as well associated with, with the warmth. So a lot of places might be able to see more fertility. They don't need to move around that much. And at the same time, they already have pottery. That means they should have the ability to store food for long time because if, if, if they want to do agriculture without storage, the food can't last long. So they, they must have already developed method to store uh, grains for a long time. So this is the condition for, for agriculture to develop. And by then the conditions are there. They, they have already been um, moving around in the neighborhood, hunter gatherers for a long time. They know where's, where's the food, what kind of food is um, available for them at what time. They probably have already watched some of the seasonal change of the, of the plants. The fruit, the plants always uh, mature at this time, take how long it mature. I think that is already accumulated knowledge among the people locals. So, so they would start to, uh, to say, okay, if we have a children in, in the group, it's not easy to move. If we have old people in the group, it's not easy to move. So I think there will be a tendency for them to say, okay, if we can stay, why don't we stay longer? The longer you stay, the more you observe the area, probably you will have more ideas about uh, staying permanently. And at the same time, we already see some of the um, people uh, started to have large buildings. The buildings probably for, maybe for religious reason, for where we don't know, but they already is able to organize themselves into big group to do large projects, put it that way. It demonstrates through their large buildings. Some of the buildings, for example, the, the big stone, it is not possible for one person to move it. It must be a a teamwork in order to move. So I think at, by then uh, the, the human has already organized themselves quite well with a lot of cooperation and the weather is changing. So it is about time to change. Uh, can you take the mic? <laughs> because so that the, the other people can, can listen to your question. Thank you. Maybe we can put a chair there so that people asking questions can. Can you hear me? Can, can you hear? Yep. Yeah. Yes. My question, I think we talked last week, where did the uh, agricultural revolution, the first one begin? And what, what uh, evidence have you got for where it began? Very good question. Okay, now where do we begin first? Okay, so we will look at that now. Um, it, the background is now they already have some temporary shelters and the duration of staying in the shelter is getting longer and longer. We know that they will be trading with each groups. So now it is possible to develop a new lifestyle and give up the hunter and gatherer lifestyle. The population increase that does necessarily correlate and improve health. Oh, that is another issue. We will, we will talk to that later on. Um, this is called revolution because it really changed a lot. Okay, the question now, where does it begin? It, it begins about 7,500 BC. So it's about 10,000 years ago. So I, I roughly say about 10,000, a little bit over 10,000, about around 10,000 years ago. In the so-called fertile crisis in the Middle East, um, can people recognize which is which? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Atonia over there, and then uh, there, uh, underneath here, I think it's the Red Sea here, is that right? Yeah. 
And so it's around this region, okay? This is called the Fertile Crescent in that region. And actually we have seen a lot of, um, for example, last time we talked about the uh, Gobi Devi Tepe is somewhere here. So it's, it's around that region. <laughs> okay, domestication of plants. I will go through that very quickly because there are a number of plants people have uh, already domesticated at, at different times. Just give you a, a range of the plants that has been domesticated and some of the consequences, some of the plants we are still using today. The evidence. Uh, Albert, you've you've suddenly become a little hard to hear. Uh, have you uh, moved? Because I take off the, the mic. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the way I, I put that you tell me, otherwise I would just keep on like that. I've told you. I've told you. Okay. How about now? Okay, is that? Yeah, it's good. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Uh, the, the tools, we see some of these uh, harvesting tools. And then we also, from these tools, we see fragments of uh, plant cellulose. So yeah, they, and then we can date it, and it is much, much more earlier. It they were at least 10,000 years before the so-called agricultural revolution. That means people had already collecting seeds for 10,000 years before they eventually make use of the seeds and plant them themselves. So it is a gradual tra transition. You will go back to the, to, the, to the time here. If we to go back another 10,000 years, so it will be on the really very uh, left on the screen. It is a cool period, still cool. cool. And then about uh, 14,000 years ago, then you go through a hot period and then cool down again. So on that period, there's a lot of change happening because life do have to adjust. And then for about um, 10,000 years and so forth, then you go through. So, about about one 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 thousand two hundred uh, one one thousand five hundred years, it the temperature change again. So this is the the period where the change do happen. Okay, go back to here. Now at that time we see that the fringe lines are very short. That is two centimeters. So probably there's six six centimeters about a length length. So it. The technique there, human technique is very good already. They are able to make very small like uh, stone lives, and they have been using it to correct uh, to, to to harvest seeds and so forth. Yes, as I said, there are traces of use as well as uh, cellulose sticking on the blade. Once agriculture started gaining momentum, suddenly it seems that uh, everywhere is spreading. We will look at the, the spread later on. People have already done some, some research to look at how fast it has been spreading. So we will do that a little later on. Okay, they have found the cops. Um, again, at that time, they have already had pottery and it seems that they, are, they started at different places, approximately the same time, of course, with different, different in time, at the same time. And different pulses, that diff, different type of plants. Okay, the first one, the wheat, which we still have a lot of wheat today. Okay, so this is one. And this wheat is native to the fertile crescent. So it's a native grass, and then they will find that that, that grass seeds is uh, 
good to eat. And we will, at that time, they already have milling. They know how to make flour. And therefore, they will be selecting a plants that have large seeds or plants which the seeds can be collected very easily. So they will have accumulated 10,000 years of experience with these plants already. And this is found in a large number of sites scattered around the fertile crescent. So maybe these people already start trading the seeds. Ah, this is good eating, etc. Can I have some take it somewhere and then plant it? I think at that time people already started to know how to encourage a plant to grow by maybe observation ex experience. Another week. The most important thing to make it grow was watering it regularly. Yes. Yeah. Look after it. Yeah. But wheat, absolutely, absolutely. Which is relatively easy to look after compared Can, with rice. Uh, uh, rice is really difficult because you, 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 oh, yeah. So rice is much more intense than wheat. Usually wheat is also a winter crop. Basically you, you plant it uh, next summer, you will have, have the, the seeds re ready. At the beginning, obviously, they will not be looking after it so much, but as they grow, get to know the experience, especially that's, that, that's the wet region, the wet time. The, the, there's a lot of rainfall at that time, so probably they can observe it and then later on uh, tend to it more. So there's another one. Uh, again, um, in the fertile crescent, uh, barley, and yet, another still using today, barley. Okay. Uh, lentils. Lentils is in the Indus region, uh, India, etc. Uh, not that, I don't know whether it's that available in China as well, but. To me, I don't recall eating lentils, lentils when I was young. So probably it's more in the Indus or the other side of the Himalaya. And it has the property of improving soil. It is one of those uh, legumes. Okay. Use the mic, please. <laughs> Sorry. Maybe I stopped asking questions. No, 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 good, good. The um, Albert, when we were in India, China on a visit about um, 10 years ago, we were talking to our tour guide and I curiously asked him, you know, what about the Indian tourists? Do they come here? You know, most of them are vegetarian. Ah, he said, he laughed and said, yeah, we find them monk food. You know, monk, monk monks. Monks, monk, okay. Monk food. Yeah. So uh, am I right in saying that the Chinese people, I don't know how relevant it is to this. You talked about lentils. We've got lentils, we eat a lot of lentils because yeah. it's high in protein. Is it that um, the Chinese people are more meat eating than vegetable eating? They are more rice and wheat eating. But what meat rather than uh, meat. wheat? Is it that they, didn't, they were not interested in lentils because they were eating more meat? No. Chinese like, like India is not very rich for a long time. So they are not eating a lot of meat. No. Meat is still, now, I remember when I was young, meat is once a month or in New Year holiday, uh, ce celebration like that, most of our, our food is. But we do have other types of protein from soy, etc., from beans and soy. Maybe lentils, climatically, is not very suitable for China to grow. Maybe, I don't know. Of course, with modern technology, it might change, but is there anybody online know why, why we Chinese haven't got in lentils, lentils? No, nobody's answering. Okay, <laughs> so sorry. We got, we, we, interesting idea, but yes, um, in terms of the contact between India and China, is Actually, to, yes? I can't answer the question directly, but um, it is, uh, I find it unusual that they haven't got lentils. The Chinese um, historically were very good at um, 
importing and using foods from all around the world. Um, you've yeah. got so many things that have come from South America, um, which have been incorporated into Chinese or yeah. um, Asian cuisine, uh, yeah. particularly chilies, particularly potato, particularly tomato, yeah. uh, etc. So yeah. it um, it just adds to the question: Why not lentils? Yeah. So that was an interesting question to research. Anyway, yes. Now, for Chinese, we recognize the food come from outside with in the name. <laughs> we have uh, fan shi, which is a sweet potato. The word fan means outside of China. Fan ke, which is tomato, which again with the word fan, which means outside. So the Ch Chinese realize we have a lot of food coming from outside. And then obviously um, Chinese has been um, trading with Europe through the Silk Road at least 2000 years ago. And of course for food coming in, if we, if we accept it in China, then I think they will establish quite quickly. So for example, when we talk about chili, I think the Chinese chili is at, at most about a thousand years old. So before that, we probably haven't got chili. Chili is very much, um, I think, it's, is that Middle East? How about, do you know? South ah. no? South America, South America, okay. So I don't know. And capsicum, is that also South America? Corn is also South America, is that right? Yeah. So they, yeah, all of the foods you mentioned um, are South American originally, <laughs> or Central American. <clears throat> because I can't answer the question, so you better ask. Hey, Albert, what's, what's the difference between split peas and lentils? What is the difference between split peas okay. and lentils? Sorry, I thought... The confusion is there's two Alberts. I didn't realise you were asking me, sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> look, I don't know. I, I'm not, uh, I don't pretend to be an expert. Yeah. Okay, so we don't... Sorry, <laughs> sorry, you can't help. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Use the mic, please, so that people can. Next time I will definitely get the why this one. I think the split pea is from the green peas, our green peas. It's soaked and you you open it, it's split. It's okay. different from the lentils. Yeah, okay. So they're, they're different so. species, probably. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Next time we, we should advertise, we need a biologist <laughs> in the group. <laughs> okay. And uh, now, peas. Uh, peas. Peace is a legume. And looking at this, not too long ago, is India is 2000 BC. So about 4,000 years. So obviously the adaptation will take time. You will discover one, one, one species, find a good eating, you will continue to develop it. Chickpeas. Again, chickpeas not one of my diet <laughs> diet and what's this no idea this is for animal so obviously when when you started farming you, you probably will also have uh, domesticated some animals so this is this one is for for um animals fact Okay, so we are going to some areas which is more than just eating. For example, uh, lean seeds. Lean seeds for oil and also for other lubrications and other uses. So also for its fiber. The flax fiber is very strong. So people start staying there, they, they are planting not only for food, they are also planting for other use. For example, for, for fiber, because after all, 
uh, people need to make clothes or beddings or whatever. So, so that is what about 5,000 years ago. Yeah. And then in China and India also domesticated them at least 5,000 years ago. So people, when they stay in one place, they obviously want to explore all the possibilities of different plants to fact saliva are two to three times as strong as cotton. But again, interestingly, today we use mostly cotton, of course, synthetic, polyester, etc. But for a long time, we have been using cotton instead of, say, what's that other one? Um, the same with, what, what is the one with, um, with the psychological, which is bang, because of his ham. Yes, ham. Ham was very strong. So Chinese use a lot, plant a lot of ham in order to produce the fiber. But I, again, uh, I don't know how ham compared with uh, facts. Sorry, I missed that. Ham? Yeah. Ham. So Chinese have been using him to make ropes and so forth for a long time. So I, I suppose that would be true for other, other areas as well. Okay, now about the spread now. Um, the, the first quantitative test is around 1970s. So it's over 50 years ago. So people, is that 50? Uh, over 50 years ago, people started dating the material. You're going to find out the spread. Because one of the reasons why we know that they have domesticated the plant is there are residues of that plants left behind. So we can date that residue, see when that plant was grow to that seeds. Because after it uh, becomes seeds, when it's not growing, it will, it's uh, carbon content, it will be fixed. So by using carbon-14, we can state and therefore trace how that spreads. So here is some, a picture of it. The dark green region is the older region. The orange region is younger region. The younger, so if we think of it as a spreading, then the older will be the origin, the original place. And then it will spread and then the later you find that it is adopted later. So we see that it is originated almost again in that um, fertile crescent. And then spread towards Europe first before it spread to the Asia continent in that direction. So it looks like it spread to Europe and then somehow people started traveling to the east and then spread to the east. The same diagram, uh, looking at spreading to England, that's what I'm interested in. It's pretty early, isn't it? There are regions, the darker red regions is uh, later. England is actually pretty early and crossing England is not easy. <laughs> it's not easy. So how they can take some, something cross over to England. Now, obviously, since crossing is not easy, when they cross, probably they, the chance of they returning is, is less. So they may probably cross it by accident. Maybe a storm rode them there and then they stay there. We don't know. But, it, but looking at it, it spread to England before it spread to the further law. Probably further law is a bit too colder. Not, not that. But again, to me, it's interesting. Why, in that case, why don't you spread eastwards? Where's the west, westward first? Now, this is a question I don't, I don't have an answer, but is an interesting observation. Anyone have any answer to that? No. I think that 
in the end, it's gone now. You know, strange thing is, oh, it's still there at that time. You just the teacher makes. Which which one? The the or the avatars? Yeah, the avatars. No, the avatars would have died out by ten thousand years ago. Uh, yeah, yeah. Later, I think the the avatars have already died out by then. Yes. No, I was about to say. I mean, you said them went to Europe and then to Asia. Interesting that the Vinayaka chap I know, the National Geography and the early days of DNA history, they they were doing for a short time for hundred dollars, where they would trace. Your heritage back to eighty thousand years, back to the time you left Africa, and he found in his DNA, and he doesn't look this way. But the majority of the time for him was actually spent in somewhere in Eastern Europe, his ancestors. Yeah, I. I People coming down. Yeah. So yeah. Could the uh, questioners please use the mic? Thanks. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Please use the mic. <laughs> Probably take a seat. Come over, and sit over here. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm embarrassed by this. <laughs> no, I think we we like question, we like discussion. No, what I was saying was Albert said that some of these things went first to Europe and then came to Asia, and I talked about one chap. He's only one person who uh, was from Sri Lanka who did this DNA ancestry in the early days when National Geographic. Did it for hundred dollars, where they would go back, not five thousand, but eighty thousand years. Yeah, I don't know how far it, true it is, but he found that in that eighty thousand years, as they left Africa, his ancestors spent more time in Europe than in the Indian subcontinent. So, if that is true generally, then I would think that the migration took place Middle East, Europe, and then down. And therefore, it's possible that's why it was late. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. Yeah. You hear the question now. Let me answer the first first part first. Is the eighty thousand? Yes. Uh, our current current uh, people from outside Africa left Africa about eighty thousand years ago. So we are all at that. But of course, uh, there are several times when when Homo sapiens left Africa. Okay. But one of the main migration time is about eighty thousand years ago, so there was a large number of um, humans migrated to the rest of the world. But there is another event which I haven't covered yet is a big volcano uh, eruption in Indonesia today's Toba. Toba a volcano eruption believed to have killed a lot of humans. Probably outside of Africa, the reproducing humans will fall down to order of thousands, maybe a thousand pair of reproducing humans at that time. So we we go through a bottleneck, but that is that happens much earlier than the agricultural revolution. As I understand it, um, there was a lot of migration from the Middle East. Along the Mediterranean, as far as Gibraltar, but um, in early days, nobody went further. Nobody actually. It, it wasn't until the Romans that um, uh, people from Europe went as far as um, Britain. But um, the, but um, at the Gibraltar was a um, a cut off point. Yeah. No. Looking at the spreading, then um, the this particular plant I don't know which which one is referring to one one particular plant spread to England about five thousand years ago. So five thousand years ago will be probably earlier than the Roman Empire, much earlier. That means by the time Ro Roman Empire uh, went to England. There were already humans in England. Oh yeah. Oh, absolutely. But there wasn't much contact between 
Europe and, um, and Britain. England, yeah, yeah. I, as I said, probably the first group arrived there won't turn back. <laughs> it will be very mm -hmm. difficult to, to come back. So th this is, at that time, I, I think most of these migrations are one way journey. You go there <laughs> and then probably settle there and then you, after a few generations, people start moving again. I, 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 now, is it uh, only humans who um, who bring uh, seeds with them? Surely the wind is also responsible for moving seeds. And the birds as well. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good, good observation. We we might need to look at the wind patterns in order to understand whether it is a natural spread. Once you start the planting, you've got a lot of those seeds and this is, will be blown away by, by wind directions. Yeah, good question. Good observation, Albert. That is something we need to do research. <laughs> no answer to that. Okay, I have here a, find a web page about the, uh, the, the uh, Toba, so I will, change the share screen to let people look at this one. So uh, I stopped the share screen. Okay. Uh, no, not desktop. Uh, I want to look at is uh, in, uh, yeah. Cause I'm sharing this and then I will move this over here to for people to have a look. Toba castor it occurs around seventy five thousand plus or minus nine thousand years ago. So it's much earlier than that one. So human have already survived a a large collapse of uh, population and have recovered because we are talking about, at the moment we are talking about ten thousand years ago. But the Toba catastrophe, uh, catastrophe. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> we are talking about seventy-five thousand years ago. Cat uh, catastrophe. Thank you, Cat catastrophe. But <laughs> and this this event is a volcano eruption in today's Indonesia. The uh, volcano crater is still there. And we believe that during this uh, eruption, the whole planet Earth had a dust from volcano about 10 to 20 centimeters thick. So it is a big, big um, distinction event. Humans survived that one with a very small number of uh, people left behind. Okay, so. Sorry, Albert. Were you saying that only two, uh, few thousand were left behind after that? In yeah, the world? In yeah. The world? In the world, yeah. About 2,000 pairs of humans left behind. So it's a, it's a bottleneck. And that's why our human population gene is very similar. We might look different, but our gene from from the point of view comparison, is very small, our gene different. Even dogs and cats have larger variation than us. Okay, let me go back to stop this share and then share, the, share this screen again. Uh, this is this one. Okay, we'll continue with this one. Where's my mouse? Uh, go over here. Now people have done a, done a regression trying to look at different sites and compare the distance and the age. It seems that in the mid near East is oldest and then gradually moving to Indus. It takes about 3,000, uh, how, how many years? Um, 10, thousand years to about five thousand it takes about five thousand years to move about three thousand three thousand kilometers 
almost one 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 kilometer per year around that number. So it, for example, the Iran, that one, the whole one, everything, that means it's the large region. I think the, it's about the Sykes. Unfortunately, I don't have the, the, the name of Sykes, but there's only a, a... Okay, all the way <laughs> to the uh, you, uh, Asia's uh, boundary. Now, the green area is the rice regions. The orange area is the millet. Chinese are main, mainly initially millet, which is imported later on. Again, that's similar to other food. Come, so the, the original um, food is dependent on which river system. The millet is usually around the Yellow River. The top one. And then the rice is along the Yangtze River. Again, that is um, called because of climate. Wheat can tolerate a bit colder, colder weather. So it is in the northern region. Millet also uh, can uh, cater for drier and colder region. So millets are in the top part. Rice typically needs a lot of rainfall water so it will be in the more northern area and Yangtze river is different from yellow river is that Yangtze river um, is pretty clear it is not yellow that means it doesn't have a lot of sentiments whereas yellow river has a lot of sentiments so yellow river flood very very rapid very frequently and by by flooding, that means it brings the nutrients to the nearby soil. So there's a risk of a flood, but at the same time, it makes the land fertile. So people are striking a balance between risk and production of food. So that yellow river has also been called the river of solo for the Chinese. Every time it is it's bank broke, many people die. And the, I think Yellow River also um, changed the cultural, cultural characteristic of Chinese. Let me, let me use politics to explain. China, uh, as, a, as a large, large country, is similar to the Roman times. Roman is a very large empire, right? All, almost all around the Mediterranean is a large country. But when Roman Empire collapsed, Europe never get to that big again. Yes, there are some big empire like the uh, the Pastinian, Pastadian, is that called Pastadian region? So there are some large empire, but not, not as large as Roman Empire. But China break up into fragments, then it will become a large empire again on the same piece of ground. And then after about 200 or 300 years, it will break down again into little fragments. Then about within 100 years, usually within 30, 30 years, then it will unite again and becomes one big emperor. That's where our dynasty change. So we have dynasty here. And then at the end of the dynasty, there's a lot of chaos, people fighting each other, revolution, everything. Then somebody will conquer everybody else and declare himself as the new emperor. We have a new dynasty. The new dynasty run for about, on average, 250 years. And then the, the dynasty will become very corrupt. The emperor's not caring for the people. People are hungry or because of disaster, every other. There are a lot of different reasons that the empire will break down. And again, they will be fighting in, in, inside China. And eventually, somebody strong will conquer everybody else and declare emperor again. So Chinese prefer a large government, whereas Europe doesn't. That's one, one observation from history. Now, the, the second observation is the attitude today towards government and the attitude 
to a Chinese towards government is quite different. Now today, uh, I would say in our Western style government, we are trying to limit the, uh, the power of our government by counterchecking each other. We have the executive branch, we have the um, legal branch, we have the legislative branch, and each other is checking against each, each other's power. We try to limit our government's power, right? This is in general. But in China, you look at 2020, when the uh, coronavirus uh, disrupt in Wuhan, the big government come in, lock down Wuhan, which is a over 10,000, sorry, 10 million people city. It's a huge city. Now, if the people rebelled, <laughs> the government can't do nothing on that because we are talking about 10 million people. If that 10 million people do not, whether actively or passively agree, you can't actually lock it down. If let's say a million people, okay, 10%, a million people going out every now and then having protests, just like what we have here in, in Victoria, for example, people protest against masks. It will disrupt anything. Chinese people that doesn't. Now, do you, you argue uh, they, they were coerced by the government? Yes, in a certain sense, they were co coerced by, by force, by whatever. But underlyingly, they still agree. If they really rebelled, the Chinese government can't do anything. I think you'd better take the mic because I think it will be interesting. Take a chair over here. <laughs> I welcome discussion. <laughs> but next time, next time, I will have a wireless. You, you said about, uh, you haven't started the next lecture on China yet, have you? No. No, no. <laughs> Almost. But, um, no, you, you said that China, uh, that the Chinese people, if they rebelled, they couldn't have controlled it. But this is the difference I see between Indian people and Chinese people. Yeah. In, he said that in Singapore, he can rule with an iron fist because as long as the economy improves and people are becoming richer, that's okay. Yeah. But in countries like India and Sri Lanka, that doesn't really matter. They don't care about being rich. They want to be very independent. Oh, okay. So, they, so, so there's a fundamental... Uh, the fundamental difference. Yeah. So, so you're saying that Wuhan, they could control it because Chinese realize that they are becoming richer and richer and their lives are improving all the time. Yeah. And they agree to be controlled. So they agree to it. Yeah. They're agreeing because, because the government has delivered on the other part of it. Is yeah. that correct? Yeah. That's what I, I'm suggesting. That, that's what I'm suggesting as the fundamental difference between the Chinese culture and, for example, Indian culture. <laughs> or European culture. Exactly. Okay, and the reason I'm trying to give you is that is the geographic reason. Okay, so I explained to you historically our government has been large government usually for most of the time. Of course, there are times when the country break into small fragments, but at that time we are, we consider that's not good time. Our good times are large government times for the Chinese. The reason is Yellow River. Yellow River bringing so much sentiments along the Yellow River, making it flood all the time. Because it flood all the time, that means the local people have to organize to build up the river banks. Now, if just one village build up the banks and the village next door doesn't, it doesn't help because when it floods, it affects everybody. So we need a large organization to organize all the people along the whole river to fill up the banks year, year and year over. The reason is that the settlements, we are talking about billion tons per year. Billions tons and without mechanical device, you cannot remove the settlements. No way, we are talking about billions tons, okay? And this is, per year, 
is not accumulated. And therefore, the only method they can do is fill up the river banks. So today, the Yellow River's river bank is actually higher than the land around the river. That's even worse, because when it floods, the flood water cannot return to the river. Is, and therefore, big government becomes unnecessary. Big government is necessary in order to protect the people. Now that's reason number one. The second reason is, we know, that there, there is a Himalaya between India and China. On the Indian side, it is flat land, very wet. Of course, when you reach the Himalaya, it's, it's mountains, but most of the India is pretty flat. Do you know what's behind the Himalaya on the other side? To bet it's plateau. Why is it plateau? Because the Asian tectonic plates and the Australian tectonic plate are colliding. Are colliding. The Australian tectonic plate is a little bit heavier than the Asia tectonic plate. And therefore, the Australian tectonic plate goes underneath the Asian plate. The Indian is basically Australian because the land Indian has is the settlements of the Australian plate. And all these Australian plate scrap up to form the Himalaya. And the plate continue underneath and therefore lift up the rest of the land on the other side. Now, because of that, that means China has been experiencing earthquake all, all for thousands of years. The plate are still moving today. So there are earthquakes everywhere along the inside of China. So again, once there is a big earthquake or a big drought or a big flood, people have no food for one or two seasons. That means one or two years. People die because you don't expect people have two or three years food reserve. So what, what Chinese government have been doing? They have this emergency system already built in. The government will release food when there's a crisis locally in order to protect people's life. So that is one another main reason why the Chinese government is willing to exchange independence, freedom with governments provision of some service, like in case of emergency, give us food, give us rescue. And a country that large has a lot of natural disasters year on year. On average, major disasters happens every 10 years, major, major one every 10 years. Every year, we have approximately 10, to 15 medium level disasters. And small ones, uh, we can't, we can't, can't. What, what do we mean by large? A earthquake magnitude seven or above is large in China. And again, that is also a very interesting uh, building difference. In Europe, you build with stone, masonry. In China, Japan, we build with wood, I don't know whether about India. What was the main building material in India? Okay, poor mud brick. What about the big one? The concrete brick. Oh, what? Oh, Stones. Stones. Okay, India is small stone base yes. for big yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Asian buildings. Yeah. But Japan, China, even the the palace. The forbidden city is wood, wood, wood structure. Why? Because earthquake. Stone is strong, but it can, it can be shake. <laughs> wood structure, lighter. It have other other um, uh, disasters like fire. Stone doesn't afraid of fire. Wood structure is afraid of fire. But fire can be controlled by providing water nearby with human 
control. So Japan, China, in this region, we mostly wouldn't do that because of earthquake. Yeah, so, so I'm saying, but that it's not in India and in that area, it's not wound based. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's more, more, of course, for the poor people, mud based. Yeah. And in even caves. In today, in, in China, there are still people living in the caves. So, looking at this, again, another um, characteristic of Chinese is especially in the in the southern part here. Rice is a high maintenance crop. You need constantly maintain the crop. And therefore, uh, the Chinese people tend to be able to work very hard. Now there, there is one uh, province, a province, a po proverb? Proverbs, proverbs. Okay, in Chinese, kan you, uh, diligent can compensate for your stupidity. Diligent, yeah, work hard. Compensate for your lack of talent. Kanan Boju. So I, I, I don't know whether there is equivalent as proverbs in Western. No. Now that, that is a very common proverb, and a young kid will learn it almost the first few months in, in school. A very common proverb. I think that reflects another condition is that is high maintenance crop rice. And therefore, you want to have a good yield, you work hard. It doesn't matter whether you are talent or not. Of course, you are talent. You can work less hard, but the Chinese people emphasize on this persuasion of, of work. Now, that is another very interesting characteristic. And therefore, in, in China, there are multi hundred years buildings. The Great Wall, it has been maintained for almost 2,000 years. The, the canal, the Grand Canal, also had been maintained for almost 2,000 years. Keep on maintaining that kind of, it's the perseverance. Oh, sorry, I'm branching to something else, but I hope it's interesting. Because you, you talked about rice, very interesting. You said it needs water. So I'm Sri Lankan by birth. So we have this old civilization uh, irrigation civilization. They have all earth dams, they have irrigation systems, canals. They are built thousands of years ago. Yeah. So would you say that if you are going to grow rice, you need a more sophisticated civilization? Yeah. Probably. So, you, so stupid people can't do this, can they? I mean, they have to be smart. <laughs> but but that's the saying is that we we need to work hard. But will hard work alone do it? Because there's a lot of engineering skills involved. Yeah. But now, in terms of that industrial skill, I have another theory. It's all a matter of demand. You have the problem, you have to solve it, okay? And another, another is in terms of number of solutions, how many people there? The more people, you always have somebody smart enough to come up with one solution. And if that one person can give good leadership, then we don't need the rest to be as intelligent. You just need to follow the leaders. So I don't agree that Yes, in terms of civilization, when you have rice, it is much more complex. But the development of complexity is not, is not, not necessarily the whole population, right? It, in the population, there's somebody will be able to come up with solutions. And once you have one, one solution, people copy. And they will spread. I think that, that is that's hu human. So anyway, in terms of food, it's different. Now, again, I don't have the time when millets are domesticated in China and what, when rice is domesticated in China. I don't have that details. If I, detail, if I have the detail, I will explain. I will give it to you next time. But if I can't, if you can find, what, find the answer, please do so. We're really interested in comparison. Now, next time, we will talk about how this agricultural revolution influenced our human behavior in a, in a more general, I'm comparing two at the moment, but I'm 
next time we're comparing our general 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 thing mostly come from uh, oh, anyway leave it to next time i don't know what what i'm talking about next time anyway okay thank you thank you thank you thank you thank okay you. you guys in thank you albert uh, thanks albert okay thank you bye thank you albert thank you.